Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. This is the first uh, natural user interface session on information visualization. Uh, please don't read the abstract that you got in your little booklet of, uh, that helps you navigate around today. It's completely wrong. Unfortunately, the, the proper abstract was on my slides, which were not installed over the weekend. So um, I'll try to wing it. Um, it is my honor to uh, welcome our speakers today. I've got a very esteemed group of information visualization experts uh, that will be talking to you about individual different topics that are their own individual areas of expertise. But I think anyone who's doing research in the general area of information visualization will get a, a great set of um, ideas and tools that they can use in their own research program. So instead of getting up and down before each speaker, I'm going to go ahead and introduce them all to you right now. To my right, I have George Robertson here, who is a researcher in my group at Microsoft Research. And he'll be talking about animation to various degrees. I have Rob DeLine, another researcher in my group, who will be talking about programming visualizations. I have Jeffrey here, here from Stanford University, who will be closing up the panel today. And I have Danielle Fisher here from Microsoft Research, another researcher in my group, who will be talking not only about his own research, but also about Stephen Drucker and his collaboration. Stephen is stuck in Brazil. They wouldn't let him out. Um, apparently, he might be on his way now, we hope. Uh, so he won't be speaking today, and Daniel will be representing him. So without further Without further ado, I'll give it. Oh, I'm Mary Schwinski from Microsoft Research. I apologize. It's probably not even in the abstract. Sorry about that. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> okay, George, take it away. Thank you, Mary. So I'm going to talk about um, things that we've learned about using animation in information visualization over the last 20 years or so. Um, one thing that we do know is that animation is uh, really good for, for some very specific reasons. Uh, for uh, directing your attention to something uh, that's particularly interesting or important. Uh, for uh, Because of object constancy, it helps you track changes that are occurring in some object over time. Um, because of our uh, intuitions about causality, animation can help you, um, you know, look at agency and see how one thing affects another thing. And then there's engagement. Animation actually increases interest in what's going on. Now those are the, the positives, but every one of those positives can turn into a negative if the animation is not done correctly. In particular, it might be drawing your attention to something not very important, so it could be a distraction. Uh, in terms of uh, object constancy, it could be relating false relationships or false agency. Uh, if there's too much animation, it might look like chart junk. Uh, if the timing of the animation is wrong, if it's too slow, it might turn out to be boring. If it's too fast, it might cause errors. So what do you do about those negatives? Um, there is a set of principles of animation that actually uh, um, was first laid out by Thomas and Johnson from um, Disney Animation in the early 80s, where they were talking about cartoon animation. And then later, uh, in the late 80s, Lassiter um, adapted those techniques for uh, computer animation. And th there are eight basic uh, techniques that are used. There are five of them listed here. Um, squash and stretch, exaggeration, anticipation, staging, and slow, out, uh, slow in, slow out. <clears throat> so um, many of these are probably familiar to you. The, um, let me just describe slow in and slow out in case these are not familiar. This is uh, taking an animation and starting slowly uh, at the beginning and ending slowly, but in the middle it's going much faster. And the reason that's important is that it focuses your attention on the beginning and the ending, which presumably are the most important 
uh, stages of that animation. So uh, in the, uh, I think it was um, 1994, Unger uh, and Chang introduced um, notions of using the same kind of animation techniques for basic UI uh, techniques. And then uh, later, Zonger and, and Salison in 2003 uh, did an analysis of how animation is used in presentations. And they had a number of, of very interesting observations. Um, one key observation is that the movement has to be meaningful. And one of the consequences of that is that some of those um, character animation techniques are, are often not appropriate. For example, Squatch, squash and stretch and exaggeration are both techniques that where the object actually takes on an unmeaningful uh, characteristic at some point during the animation. So they argue that those should be avoided. Another thing they point out is that um, particularly anticipation and staging are really important for directing your attention and, and helping you understand uh, what's going on during the animation. They argue strongly that you should only do one thing at a time um, and they, they actually distinguish between uh, animation for dynamics and transition animations and as you'll see in a moment I think transition animations are actually one of the most uh, powerful of the classes of animations. So uh, there were a number of principles that have been developed over this time. Uh, some of the best principles have come from Barbara Tversky and her group at Stanford, uh, where she's done a lot of analysis trying to understand when animation is effective and when it's not effective. And she has two uh, really key principles. The congruence principle essentially says that the internal and external representations need to be um, consistent or correspond with each other. And the apprehension principle says that the external representation needs to be uh, readily and accurately perceived and easy to understand. So how do those translate into actual principles that we can use in computer graphics and, and uh, in information visualization? Well, for congruence, uh, it's, it's telling us that we need to maintain valid data graphics during transitions, uh, that we need to maintain a consistent mapping uh, between the syntax and semantics of what's going on. Uh, we need to avoid ambiguity, obviously. For apprehension, we need to group similar transitions, uh, minimize occlusion, and maximize predict uh, predictability. When possible, we need to use simple transitions, but sometimes that's not possible. And in the case where you need something more complex, we need to stage those complex transitions. And finally, we need to make sure that the uh, animations are uh, only as long as needed. So now, uh, let me take a, a, a big overview of the last 20 years. And to me, there are five areas that where animation has been used in information that uh, all have, have had some success. Uh, the most successful, I think, is transition animations. These are uh, short animations that keep the user in context during some view or data transformation. Uh, second is animation of trends, that is showing how data is changing over time. I'm going to give examples of both of those two in more detail. The third is um, static depictionists of motion. This is work that uh, Patrick Bausch and others uh, did in, in 2006. Uh, this is uh, actually not animation, but it's a, a static simulation of animation using semi-transparent trails. So that image you see on the right is a slider that has been moved to the right, and that semi-transparent trail is telling you that that motion occurred. Uh, the fourth group has to do with uh, kinetic visualization. And here, uh, this is work that uh, Colin Ware uh, originated, and then uh, Rusty Bobrow also did uh, some work on this. 
Uh, the basic idea is, is to take a set of objects and put them in motion for a short period of time. So for example, the set might be doing a, a circular motion. And what they discovered is, uh, for one thing, that motion pops out. So the set very rapid, you know, instantly is visible to you as a set. But they also discovered that you can put multiple sets in different motions. So you might have a circular motion and another motion that's going up and down. And you can perceive as a pop-out effect a number of these motions simultaneously. And then the fifth category is uh, animation used to illustrate a process. And uh, this is actually some of the earliest work. Uh, in fact, in the scientific visualization field in the early and mid 80s, uh, that was a key principle of using animation to illustrate some simulation of a physical process, like how a thunderstorm is formed. And then in the uh, information visualization field, one of the early examples of this was algorithm animation. So now I'm going to focus in on transition animation and trend animation. And um, I'm going to start by describing some work that I did at Xerox Park in uh, the uh, late 80s and early 90s on cone trees. And this was one of the uh, early examples in information visualization of using a one second transition animation to help the user retain context of what's going on. So I'm going to show you a brief video and I need to explain what you're going to see so that the video will make sense. Uh, cone trees are, it's a 3D representation of a tree and when you um, select one of the nodes in the tree, the tree uh, the various cones in the tree rotate around so that the selected node and the path to the root all comes to the front of the view. Um, and I'll show this video and the first thing you'll see is um, a couple of selections without animation. So when you make the selection without animation you see a different tree but you don't really know what happened and so you have to think about there's another one. You just don't understand what happened. With a one second animation, you, your, your uh, perceptual system is tracking what's going on and you don't have to think about what you're looking at. You understand what you're looking at. So it saves quite a bit of time. And that's the key principle that we're using in, in all transition animations. Now another one I want to briefly talk about is uh, work we did on polyarchy. This was uh, introduced at CHI 2002. <clears throat> polyarchy is a way of showing uh, multiple intersecting hierarchies. And the way animation is used <clears throat> is to show the relationship between the different dimensions or hierarchies. And we actually did a number of user studies and looked at a variety of different animation styles. And I want to point out one particular one, which is um, the, the one we started with, is a rotation around a, a vertical axis. So this sequence that you're seeing, uh, the, the first one here is looking at um, people in, a, in an organization chart in a management hierarchy and I'm pivoting to a business unit hierarchy. So the next frame is showing uh, on the right is a mirror image of the business unit hierarchy uh, rooted at the, for the, with the common node that's the selected node in the visualization. And then it goes through a one second or so uh, rotation about the, the um, vertical axis and then Finally, at the end, it eliminates the uh, dimension that you started with. <clears throat> so that another style that we used was a sliding animation where the, the new um, dimension slid into view over the existing uh, dimension. And one of the interesting things we saw in our user study was that s for some tasks, the ro rotation animation was much more effective and for some tasks, the sliding animation was more effective. And we didn't quite understand why until we went back to some earlier work that was done by Prophet and Kaiser in 1993, where they observed that uh, rotation and translation motions have different perceptual significance. In particular, 
rotations help define 3D form, whereas translations are defining object-relevant displacements. And what we found when we went back and looked at our individual tasks in the user study was that some of the tasks actually did need the user to understand that 3D form, and many of them did not. So that explains why um, you know, one, one animation worked better than the other sometimes. Uh, so that's an important thing to know, that, that animations, uh, it's not always clear exactly what form the animation should take, and you, re you really have to look at the task that the user is performing to figure out the correct animation to use. So now I'm going to talk briefly about a system that we did um, in, that we introduced at InfoViz 2007 called DynaViz. This is a, um, uh, a visualization framework. The main thing I'm going to talk about here is the animation aspects of it, where we did animated transitions to show uh, changes in chart type or changes in the data or uh, changes in the, in the view. And uh, let me give you a brief demo of this. Um, Okay, so um, the thing to pay attention to is what's in the middle of the screen. This is the result of a SQL query uh, showing some information in a, in a uh, bar chart. And um, if I change anything, for example, if I go to a log axis, we animate that transition. Um, if I do a sorting operation, we uh, animate that uh, sort. And notice the animation that I'm doing is using uh, staggering. That is, if you did the obvious animation and had everything move at the same time, they would all pass each other in the middle. Um, and you would lose track of what you were trying to follow. But with simple staggering, you don't have that problem. So uh, that's an example where staging and, or staggering um, improves user understanding. So if I uh, change the data, in this case, the data I'm going to change to has a larger range. So we actually do a staged animation where we change the range first, and then we change the data. If I add uh, additional another series to this, I grow that series in place next to the original series. If I switch to, uh, say, a stacked bar chart, you see a, a staged animation where the stacking occurs. If I switch to a 3D stacked view, you see an animation of a view transition um, from 2D to 3D. Um, if I go to the full 3D view, it's another staged animation, which is moving uh, the information that was stacked uh, back in depth. Um, I can also go to, say, a stacked line chart. In this case, it's also animating the morphing of a shape from a bar to a line, or a stacked area chart is taking a line to um, an area. And I can even go to something complex like a, a pie chart. And in the case of going from a pie to uh, one of these other forms, if you'll notice, that's another staggered animation to help you understand exactly what the uh, transformation is of the information. Uh, let's see. Okay, so switching gears now, I want to talk briefly about trend visualization. And um, interesting thing happened uh, in 2006, um, Hans Rosling introduced Gapminder Trendalyzer at the TED conference. And I'm going to show you um, what he did. This was a presentation using an animated bubble chart. And he was uh, showing you, uh, the video I'm going to show is of 88 countries over a 20 year time period showing the change in uh, life expectancy and infant mortality. And, oh great. Okay, so you see the general trend, uh, increased life expectancy. And notice here that Rwanda in 1994 uh, rapidly started having decreasing life expectancy. Let me play that again for you. So you see this general trend, and you see Rwanda right here um, 
rapidly decreasing in life expectancy. So it turns out that is effective in a presentation because the presenter is telling you where to look. It turns out if you don't know where to look, if you're doing analysis, then um, this animated technique doesn't work very well because you have to play it over and over again to figure out where to look for the details. So we came up with two alternatives which are actually static depictions of motion. One of them is a traces view that's showing all of the transitions happening simultaneously. And you can see Rwanda uh, has a pop-out effect. You see that, that anomaly uh, re readily without having to know where to look. Um, another alternative is a small multiples view. And again, so this is uh, one image for each of the traces. And Rwanda is right here, and it's another pop-out effect, although in this case, it does require uh, some scanning of the, the multiples. So the conclusion on, on this is that um, all three kinds of animation, the static uh, depictions of motion and the animated view, are good for different purposes. The animated view is good for presentation. The static depictions are, are, good for, are better for analysis. So let me uh, draw this to a conclusion. Um, from my experience over the last 20 years of doing this, the, um, the two most effective uses of animation have to do with transition animations and the use of uh, animations for trend presentations. And for transition animations, what we found in our various studies is that uh, if you use a fixed time for the animation and make it somewhere between a half a second and one second, then you get really good results. You improve user task performance time, you decrease errors, you increase user satisfaction, and you can actually improve on that by appropriate use of uh, staging and staggering of animations when, it, when it's appropriate. Now, the interesting thing that I think is still an unsolved problem is that we know that that range between a half second and one second gives you good results, but we don't know exactly what the optimum time is. And in fact, we believe that the optimum is a function of the complexity of the animation. That is, the number of objects in motion and probably the distances they have to travel. But exactly what that function is is still an, an open research question. So at that point, I'm going to stop and ask for questions. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, two questions. I was struck by the animation that you have essentially n squared. Switch it on. The bottom. So um, are, are you talking about in the Dynaviz thing that? Yeah, yeah, the one that shows the, the, the lines, the bars, the, the right. stack. Right. Well, it's, it's not an actually an n squared problem. But we have, uh, there are two things going on there. We have a basic engine that understands uh, how to morph some set of shapes from one shape to another. And then if there's something that doesn't fit in that set that is, well, I think we have a, um, about maybe two dozen different shapes that we can morph between. If you're not in that set, then we just use a, a, a crossfade to um, you know, do, do it instead of one of, of one of those morphing transitions. And then the other trans, transformations for positions and orientations are all uh, simple linear interpolations. So it's not actually an n-squared problem that we have to solve. So 
Another question? Yes. Um, so, so you mentioned we don't know exactly what the optimum time is, you know, half a second or one second. It occurs to me also that that would vary by user, you yeah. know, like a, 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 an older person might like a slower time, yes. as you and I might start Ab to think about. Uh, Absolutely. If, if, uh, is that true? And if it is true, how could you uh, gather that information quickly about what the right time is so that you can tune the uh, yeah. animation? Uh, you, you hit on exactly, th there are two problems to solve here. One is uh, how do you deal with the complexity of the scene and the other, as you point out, is uh, how do you deal with uh, individual differences because some users will want it faster than, than others. And I think those are both kind of unsolved problems at this point, but they both need to be solved. Yes. Okay, I think I have to stop at this, this point. Thanks very much. Hi, um, I'm Rob DeLine. I uh, run a small research group here at Microsoft that studies the work practices of software development teams and looks for opportunities to help make those teams more productive. Um, so basically, uh, I want to talk to you today about an active project uh, that's going on in my group. Um, so this will be very much at the applied end of the visualization spectrum. Um, so rather than relying on slides, I'm going to be extremely brave and give you about a 10-minute live demo of a very active project. So I'm sort of praying to the demo gods that it will all work out okay. Um, and if not, please uh, bear with me. Um, so what you're looking at up here is a screenshot of the current version of Visual Studio. Um, the reason I wanted to show you this is because the demo that I'm going to show you is a replacement for the very typical user experience that you get from a development environment. Eclipse would look very similar. The development environment on Apple looks very similar. Um, and in my group, we rather sarcastically refer to this as the bento box design. I mean, basically, the development environment's user experience partitions the screen into these little boxes in much the same way that a bento box will partition your lunch into little compartments. Um, now, I don't want to make too much fun of it. I mean, after all, this design is about 20 years old, and people are productive with this every day, right? So there is something quite good about it. But there are two major flaws that I want to talk about in this that we're working on improving um, through the new project. So one problem is that if you look at the code, which is the center box in the screen, you really only get about 20 or 25 lines of code at any one moment. Now, if, even if you have a modest system of, say, 50,000 lines of code, that's less than 1% of your system that's visible to you at any given time. So as a result, um, what ends up happening is that developers get extremely disoriented in this user interface. Um, Basically, there's a, there's a sort of hypertexting kind of navigation style that goes on. So there are all these different tool windows off to the side. You click on things, and it changes the content of the main window. And you only get to see a little tiny portion. So as a result, it's very disorienting. You're constantly seeing these tiny little chunks all over the place. So that's one issue we want to deal with, is, is that disorientation. The other issue is that um, we've done job shadowing type field studies of development teams. And what we've seen is that developers spend anywhere from about a quarter to a third of their, of their daily work just seeking information. So they have question after question after question while they're doing their tasks. And they are constantly looking for information, either through doing things like code search or search on the web or quite often by walking up and down the hallway, knocking on each other's doors, saying, hey, do you have two minutes for me to ask you a question? OK, so information seeking is a huge part of development work. And basically, this design doesn't really do much to help information seeking. Uh, the questions are typically answered by shooting off queries, and those end up compartmentalized in these tiny little boxes. OK, so those were the two problems, disorientation and poor support for information seeking. And so now I want to show you a demo that um, is starting to address some of that. So again, you're, you're looking at the same version of Visual Studio, but this time the user experience in front of it is our project called Code Canvas. 
So the idea is rather than having this tabbed document well be the center of the user experience, instead what we have is a 2D zoomable surface. So what you're looking at is all the files of, in this case, a Tetris game, a fairly small implementation of the Tetris game. And these files um, are sort of spread out on this 2D surface. Um, so you're looking at both code files. Um, and in the case over here, you're looking at user interface design. So these are some dialog boxes from the game. So the idea is that whatever documents constitute the work, all of those documents in their heterogeneous forms should be on the same surface all mingled together. Um, each of these things is actually, in fact, uh, a live editor. So these things are just as editable as they would be. So I have my IntelliSense support and all that kind of good stuff that I'm familiar with from the previous user experience. Um, but here, we've spread them out on a surface. So that way, we can actually form a kind of overview map of the project. So we're big fans of maps in my group. And so we use this kind of mapping metaphor. So the idea is that all these different editors that you just saw are organized into the structure that makes up the project. So uh, each of these paler bubbles are the different classes that are in here. Um, these darker bubbles are the directories that hold those classes. And the idea is that I can generally just sort of click and zoom my way around to get to know the project. So one of the very traditional visualization techniques that we're using here is semantic zoom. So obviously at this level of zoom, the code itself is not readable. I mean, it's visible in kind of skeletal forms. That gives you some sense of what's going on. But one of the things we do is we take the identifiers from the code, the parts, the names that are going to be the most meaningful to the programmers, and we keep those nice and large at a readable size so that way you can stay oriented. Um, the other thing that's going on here is that um, this view is spatially stable. Um, so as I zoom around, it's a fairly literal zoom. It's not a sort of fisheye where I'm kind of constantly warping space. I'm keeping space nice and stable. The reason for that is that we want developers to be able to form a spatial memory of the overall space and then be able to leverage that um, as they move around. So let me go ahead and zoom out a bit here. So our, one of our answers to this problem of keeping developers oriented is basically to allow them to use spatial memory to stay oriented in this space. Um, the other problem, as you remember, is the problem of information seeking. Um, so developers have lots of questions. Um, so for example, I might have a question. This is a game. I might want to know, how do people generally keep score in this game? You know, what parts of this code base have to do with keeping score? So I can bring up the usual search dialog box. And I'll search for score. And as you can tell, I can get the same kind of list experience that I got before, because lists are quite useful. We don't want to get rid of them. Um, but in this case, uh, I also take those search results and I overlay them on top of uh, the Zoomable canvas. So this way I can see, aha, so a lot of the scorekeeping takes place in this GA Tetris class. Some more takes part in this Tetris grid class. And there are a few more scores uh, happening over here. Um, if I want to investigate this, I can just click to zoom in on the different scores. Um, and what we do is, after you've zoomed in, rather than cropping out all the search results that happen to be off screen at the moment, we basically make them stick in this kind of ghosted form onto the sides of the screen. Um, these then become navigation handles, so I can click on those. Um, so I see here an initialization of score to zero. If I want to know where that is, I can just click on it, and it will take me over there. So a different kind of visualization that can be useful um, is things to do with the execution of the program. So let's go ahead and run this program. OK, so here's the Tetris game coming up. And I'll go ahead and start a new game. And what's going to happen is I've set various breakpoints throughout the game, because I'm trying to understand how it works. 
And in a moment, we're going to hit a break point. So here we go. So I have hit a break point. In fact, I've hit a break point at this particular line of code. Again, we're sort of using semantic zoom. Obviously, that line of code would be way too small to read at this level of zoom, so we pop it out so you can see it. And what you're seeing is a set of broken arrows that represent the different calls that are going on in the call stack. So if I like, let me zoom out just a wee bit more. Um, we also provide a timeline. Um, so if I want to understand the execution of the code, I can basically watch the timeline. So uh, we can see in the lower right-hand corner there, execution starts at main, and then it goes to this menu click, because you saw me start a new game with a menu click. Um, and then we go to this init new game method, um, and so on and so forth, until we can see that we've chosen a particular figure um, that we're starting the game. Now, one of the things that's really nice about having everything be on the same surface is for things like comparative tasks. So imagine that this call stack represents a crash in the program. And imagine that I suspect that the crash has something to do with scorekeeping. So I can see the crash as this execution trace. I can see the search results for scores. And now I can just do a quick visual comparison. And in fact, I can see well, most of the call trace does not look like it has very much to do with scorekeeping. Most of the scorekeeping is kind of up here and over here. So if I had a hypothesis that the crash had to do with scorekeeping, I can instantly see that's not a very likely hypothesis. Maybe I'll look elsewhere. Now imagine doing this in the bento box design. You'd have search results off in one box that would just have a bunch of file names. You would have this uh, call stack off in another box. Um, also a set of file names. The comparative task would be really difficult. Um, one thing I should have pointed out a little bit earlier um, is that we also want, um, we want this surface to generally not only house your work, but to be a kind of rich media. Um, so right now, just as a kind of early first steps towards that, we allow you to put sticky notes all over the code because we know communicating about the code is important. Um, so for example, I'm forever figure, uh, sort of getting confused about which Tetris piece is which. So what I did is I took a little screenshot of each of the pieces as they were falling, and then I put it as a sticky note next to that particular class that implements it. And it just helps me very quickly remember, oh yeah, that piece that looks like that is implemented right there in that class. Um, so what I've shown you here is some support for some overview tasks. But of course, a lot of times developers want to do focus work, and they don't want to work on the whole darn project all at once. Um, so we've um, we've got some support for that. We've got something called a filtered canvas. So since I'm working with the call stack here, um, let me go ahead and just filter uh, the canvas down to the call stack. And what's going to happen is it's going to create um, a new canvas that's basically filtered down to just those items that were on the call stack. Let me get rid of some of this clutter. I should also mention we have a kind of layered architecture here, not unlike the layers of a Photoshop drawing, let's say. So it's quite easy to get rid of things that are not relevant. So now here you can see I've created a brand new canvas for this task. I can have as many canvases as I like. Um, and this one is focused down to just those pieces of code um, that have to do with this call stack that I'm trying to understand. Um, if this were a slightly bigger monitor, you would basically be able to read the, all the code for this given call stack all on one screen, which is quite handy. Um, again, to support spatial memory, we keep things in the same relative spatial ordering that they were on the main canvas. So here, uh, if I switch back to the main canvas, there we go. You can see kind of the general shape of the arrows kind of heading off to the left. And then again, on this filtered canvas, again, sort of the same relative shape to help maintain your spatial memory. Um, so just as a quick wrap up, I will say this is a really active project that's going on right now. Um, the stage that we're at is uh, we're doing a bunch of user testing at the moment on systems that are basically you know, really small, like this 30,000 line Tetris game. We're also doing a lot of engineering work, trying to get it to the point where we can use it on a daily basis ourselves. Um, there's two reasons for that. One, obviously, is that if you use it every day yourself, you'll find all those usability issues super quick. Um, and then the other thing is that we're really interested in doing visualizations over the long history of realistic projects. 
So we want to have visualization layers that show you things like where has the code been churning lately? Where has all the activity of the team been going on lately? Who owns which parts of the code based on historical check-in data and so on? So in order to do that, we need a project. We need to scale to projects that have long histories. So that's the current status. And with that, I thank you. Maybe a couple of quick questions? <laughs> I saw his hand up first. Hi. What determines where the different classes or methods to, uh, uh, are placed on the 2D layout? Yeah. So um, for layout, we basically use a sort of mixed initiative approach. So we have a graph layout engine that's uh, integrated into this. Um, it does things like prevents things from occluding one another, that kind of thing. But it also does our initial layout for us. Um, but like I said, we consider this a kind of medium for describing the system. So therefore, any piece can be picked up and moved around. Um, the other thing is that a task canvas like this is meant to be for just one person. The home canvas, the big one that I showed you, that's shared among all team members. So it's a kind of um, all team members together decide which parts of the system um, go in which parts of the space. Um, and we've done some previous field studies that show that teams actually do this today because they consistently draw things on the whiteboard in the same spatial layout. And in fact, they'll even go in the hallways and they'll do things like, this component is talking to this component. I mean, they'll literally do this with their hands, and they're referencing a shared space that already exists. So we're trying to take advantage of that. So yeah, thank you. This is very interesting. Um, have you done um, eye tracking studies on this so far? And are you thinking about doing a longitudinal eye tracking study of all your development team as they develop it over long term? Yeah, so um, we would love to go into eye tracking. In fact, uh, I've planned a few studies in the past, but the eye trackers are so popular in our lab that like, I never seem to get to the front of the queue. Um, but in general, there have been some eye tracking studies on student programmers, but almost none that I know of that have been done on professional programmers. And even the bento box, bento box design has not been well studied with respect to eye tracking. So I think it's a really, I mean, they're, they're, it's just a wide open area. I think it would be great. All right, with that, I will turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Rob. Um, my name is Danielle Fisher. I'm over in Mary's group. I am a researcher here in information visualization, and I worked for quite a while with George. Um, today, because Steve Drucker is on a plane from Newark, New Jersey, and will be landing here sometime this afternoon, and therefore can take some questions in person, I'm going to give about 10 minutes of talk on natural user interaction, thinking about the collaborative visualization space. I'm then going to come to a screeching halt and attempting no transition whatsoever. I'm going to switch over to talking about a project called Web Charts, a uh, toolkit, which will in part introduce uh, Jeff Hare's connection. So perhaps I'm talking a little bit about several of the topics we're having today. Um, I want the, the genre of the project Cambiera is thinking about the issue of collaborative text analysis. So uh, Rob just introduced us to this idea of developers having a shared space that they're thinking about where their uh, files are. And he also talked about this idea of being out of context, having too many files and too much stuff to keep track of. So this happens in, of course, many cases besides programming. Uh, this picture on the bottom right, for example, is a group of system biologists, I believe, who are digging through uh, genetic maps. Um, we decided for the specific task that we're interested in to work on a project called, uh, in, in, in the area of visual analytics, called the uh, Triceratops problem. It's a human designed problem. It involves 310 newspaper articles from which users need to extract a subset that are relevant to a task that they've been given. So there's a mystery that they're trying to solve. And we are trying to build a tool that would help users make their way through this complex data set and understand sort of the interactions between documents and between ideas. 
So what we wanted to encourage and allow specifically is one, for users to follow separate hypotheses individually. But, for, but two, we wanted to take advantage of collaboration. We wanted pairs of people to be able to work together and to share ideas. So we were trying to balance these tensions of allowing users to work individually, as some collaborative systems have, and on the other hand, to uh, work collaboratively and share the space. Um, now, this can be a challenge. Uh, the New Yorker has talked about some of the issues that we run into in this context. Um, and a number of people have played with uh, different spaces. And we're going to hear this afternoon, I believe, from uh, one set of talks about a number of interesting work happening in the surface. We also chose the surface. It's interesting because it's a large multi-touch system. It allows a, large num uh, a number of people to sit down in front of it. It doesn't distinguish who's touching it. But, we, but we'll show you some ways that we worked around it. And we're trying to find this, what we call mixed focus collaboration, ability to handle both uh, work where individuals are working alone, what we call uh, loosely coupled, and allowing people to work closely together. That's because uh, we uh, previous work by uh, Petra Eisenberg found that collaborative information analysis actually goes through different phases. When people are clarifying what the problem is, or strategizing, or figuring out whether their solution is right, validating it, they tend to work closely together. On the other hand, searching through data alone, even when they're in a highly collaborative system, they'll tend to work separately. One person owns the keyboard, or one person will do a search. And they'll dig around in that data, and then they'll try and share it with their colleague. So we wanted to allow both of these modes, and to allow a fairly smooth transition back and forth. So we wanted to support individual and group work. Um, right, and we wanted to allow users to sort of be aware of what each other are doing. So with no further ado, what I'm going to do is switch over to a video of the Cambiera system and try and give a sense back. And try and give a sense for how this played out. Sorry. I'll talk over it rather than having uh, the voice talk. So as you can see, we designed this around the Microsoft Surface. It's designed for two analysts working together. Um, and the general notion, again, is that we're trying to allow pairs of people to share information. So inside this data set, users were presented with initial prompt, which led them to generate some sort of search. So here a user has done a search for, in this case, BSE, bovine spongiform encephalitis. Turns out that this data set has 33 different articles that mention BSE, so they decide to do another couple of searches instead of uh, diving into that one. 33 seems like too much to deal with. FDA has a much more reasonable five, so they'll start with that. Documents are ordered ah. from it. Sorry. So um, what you can see here is several different things have gone on simultaneously. When they did the search for FDA, five different documents were read, or five different documents are uh, available. They have read none of them so far. Each of these little vertical bars represents a single document. The light orange stripe, uh, the dark orange stripes represent the fact that each of these documents has the word FDA in it. The pale orange stripes on top represent the fact that these documents also all have, that these three documents all mention the word BSE. So this is interesting. We've been able to do a conjunction search on these documents. These two documents contain uh, BSE and FDA, but do not mention Canada. The little histogram on the bottom just shows how many hits on the word there are so that users can get a sense for how uh, dense the documents are. It's got the usual search engine features, so you can run your finger over it and be, be able to find out uh, excerpts from the document, the title, the date, other, wor other documents that found, or sorry, other words that found that document. So we're trying to manage most of the tools that a standard search engine does. Now, uh, when the user expands the document out using the gesture we're all now very familiar with, you can see that they begin to, uh, when the user expands out the document, uh, the word is highlighted within the document, so they can actually see the keywords as they have shown up. And if more than one keyword was available, it would be there too. Once you've read a document, it turns a little bit gray so that you can tell which documents have been read. This allows the users to uh, share information about what they're doing and allows users to track their way through this large, complex data space. So we read this document, we decide that we've had enough, and we can close it. This reduces to a little icon which we can leave around on the desktop, or in this case, we're going to share over to our colleague. We open a second document here, 
And this time we find out, as we're reading it, that there's a word that seems particularly interesting here. So we're going to take that word, and simply by highlighting it, we're now able to search for it. So we're being able to build connections between different sorts of documents and different ideas. Uh, as, as you can see, we've decided to take this document, but we've also generated a new search. And this new search, as you can see, overlaps heavily with the previous ones. This new red stripe has lots of the previous orange stripes, so we know that there's some sort of overlap. We know that these ideas seem to be linked together. Meanwhile, on the other side, our colleague is doing a second search. And so when they do their search, we can see that our search lights up with blue. So when my colleague does his searches, they light up in blue. My searches light up in orange, so that we can actually see what each other's work is showing. Conversely, their searches can see at my stripes. So these little stripes allow us to understand what each other are doing and understand what the important ideas that we're uh, overlapping on. Uh, what this allows us to do overall is allows me to work separately, as I said before. I can do my searches, not have to pay any attention. But on the other hand, if I start hitting things that are of shared interest, if I do start seeing things that I might want to know about from your side, uh, I start seeing both the gray bars of documents you've read, and I start seeing the colored stripes of searches that you've done. So with this, we're able to share and interact around this set of documents and start understanding each other's ideas and searches. We've done some user studies um, that we are reporting in a couple of upcoming conferences, essentially showing that users are, in fact, able to arrange the desktop, figure out each other's documents, and we're able to uh, collaborate very interestingly around this data set. Um, the way that I'd, I believe, right. So overall, what we've done is we've provided the system that allows this interesting sort of awareness between different users collaborating over this, uh, over the uh, surface and allowing this, uh, new, this taking advantage of some of the new user interface principles to allow users to work together. Um, we call this technique collaborative brushing and linking, the idea that the things that I do are also linking with, my, with the other user. And I'm actually going to uh, stop that talk there, as I said, and switch over now to talking a little bit about uh, the web charts project. Again, I apologize for the lack of transition. Um, so. The second project, Web Charts, is in collaboration with uh, Steve Drucker, Roland Fernandez. Um, Steve, as I said, is on a plane right now. Uh, we've talked a lot about uh, data visualization, and you'll hear more from Jeff about some of the virtues of why data visualization helps you understand data sets. What I really want to emphasize right now, though, is that new visualizations are coming out every day. Um, we're seeing all sorts of cool stuff that's being presented by someone or another out there. Wordle was put together by IBM a couple years ago and has become an incredibly popular method. And you see Wordles popping up in all sorts of different places. Um, Jeff's ProtoViz toolkit allows you to, uh, which we'll be talking about in a bit, allows you to build large numbers of really interesting uh, visualizations. This is a parallel coordinate system. Um, this is a uh, tree map. Hi, Ben. Um, built over the JavaScript InfoViz toolkit. What I want to highlight is that these are a lot of different toolkits out there, all showing visualizations that are out on, available on the web, all written in their own languages, and unfortunately, none of which are particularly compatible with either each other or with the applications where data tends to live today, like Excel, or your favorite database program, or your favorite online spreadsheet program. So we're really interested in finding ways to help these visualizations connect with each other. What happens today, of course, is that you assemble your data in your data management program. Then you copy your data from the, from the data management program into your visualization program. Unfortunately, this can be cumbersome. It can be slow. You lose a lot of the cool advantages of being able to manipulate your model and interact with the data. And uh, you can run into compatibility issues, system issues, and that sort of thing. Uh, so what we'd really like to do is start thinking about visualizations as a possible extension into applications. Let the experts in visualization do visualization work. Let the experts in applications do application-specific work, and then bring in the visualizations that they need. Um, the, now, the, when you implement a new visualization as an extension to an existing application, 
that tends to mean that you have to either talk to an existing visualization toolkit or you go out and you build the thing anew. And in fact, this was the problem that motivated us. We were talking with several teams at Microsoft that were all trying to figure out what new visualizations to include in the next version. They had some visualization toolkits, but they'll, still they were trying to decide, do we put in a tree map or not? And if they do put in a tree map, that's great. We have a tree map. And if they don't put a tree map, we don't have a tree map for you know, the next version of the product. And there's a three-year product release cycle. So you're not going to see a tree map in that product for another six or eight or 10 years. We'd like to sidestep that, dis that discussion, make it possible for a user to add their own visualizations, to choose what they want. So to do that, we've created a plugin mechanism that in general allows any application that speaks our plugin language to uh, communicate data back and forth from the host application to interchangeable visualizations. So in my remaining couple of minutes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over and give a quick demo of this system, which we call Web Charts. Web Charts is a, visual, is a visualization toolkit. What is going on? Built over built over Excel, um, as well as several other languages, or uh, several other systems. What's interesting about it is that it's pulling down visualization descriptions from the web. That is, it's pulling down instructions for how to run the visualization from the web. But it's actually running the visualization locally by embedding a web browser. Great thing about this is that virtually every computer programming language today has some sort of web browser object. All web browsers speak some form of JavaScript. So we actually can be very flexible. So I'm going to this website, HTTP Web Charts, right now. And I'm going to pull down the description of what a bar chart is. And I'm going to bind it to this set of data that I've just selected in Excel. Um, now, this is real data. I can do all the sorts of things that I'd expect. If I change this bar to 50 the, or you know, 100, the data updates itself. As you can see, as I scroll around inside the data, the selection goes back and forth between the, uh, between the data set and the original data. So I have this uh, back and forth connection between the two. And now this is interesting because I can start doing a number of interesting things. Um, as I said, we're actually pulling down these, web, these descriptions from the web. So rather than using a, the bar chart that I was showing before, I could pull up a tag cloud. Let's switch that to a reasonable size. And now as I select entries inside the tag cloud, it jumps back and forth. It's also selecting at the same time inside, inside, the, uh, table, inside the bar chart, inside the tag cloud. Now, the tag cloud is written in JavaScript. The bar chart is written inside Silverlight. They all just kind of work together because we've got this uh, shared layer that's actually providing intercommunication between them. A third visualization that I'd just like to highlight in this demo is that we're able to send data out onto the web. So in this case, we are going to uh, Bing Maps using their API to geolocate and georesolve the names Britain, United States, Spain, and so on. So we're actually able to generate this chart. Now, we've got some incorrect mappings here. What I really, whoops, what I really wanted to do, in fact, was for this chart to understand that I wanted the size to map to that second column. The good news is I can just highlight that, and it goes ahead and maps the data appropriately. Um, what was the other feature I wanted to highlight? Um, we can also send instructions to the charts. So in this particular case, this chart understands a notion of color style. So I can tell the chart that I wish it to be rendered in green. And it goes ahead and renders itself in green. Now, this chart is going to the net to resolve these words and to figure out where, say, Berlin is. But it's not doing any other uh, web resolution. It's not, for example, actually uploading my data to the web which is kind of nice because that means that I can feel at least reasonably secure about the information that I'm maintaining locally. Now, we've implanted a number of different visualizations over this. Here, I've got a tree map that's built in Excel, again, over the same mechanism. On the left, we've got a Microsoft organizational hierarchy. On the right, we've got the visualization of how that works. And if I were to go ahead and change someone's name, uh, 
because we now have an employee apparently named Hello World that should in fact, um, Dred, I'm sorry, that in fact shows up on the chart, the data updates itself appropriately. So in other words, what we've been able to do, switching back to the podium, is show that is show that we can use this fairly generic infrastructure to pull in a number of different visualization systems. Now because we're using a standardized data protocol that works across different systems and across different controls, while we've built this for Excel, we've also been successfully able to implement this and put it into programming languages. Uh, we've got it working over Iron Python. We've got it working over Visual Studio. We're trying to get it working over several other contexts too. We're very excited about the possibility of being able to drop in and allowing users to drop in arbitrary visualizations into arbitrary systems. On that, I think I'm going to have to close and thank you all for your time. Um, I'd be delighted, delighted to take a couple of questions. And I'll pass the baton on to uh, Jeff Hare. Do I do anything to get this working? Uh, which laptop are you on? Five. Should be just. Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Excellent. So, my name is Jeff Hare. I'm an assistant professor at Stanford University where I co-run a group uh, conducting visualization research. So the types of questions we're interested in are what are the perceptual, cognitive, and social factors that go into making sense of data sets, and then using that to design new novel visualization tools to help people make sense of data. And so what I want to talk about today, kind of following on from Daniel's discussion of toolkits, is really how do we design visualizations and how we put the power to create novel and customized visual representations into the hands of a broader class of users. And now to do that, I'd first like to start with some historical context. And one of the lovely things about working in visualization is that we have centuries of context to both inspire us and challenge our thinking. So for example, I can go back to 150 AD when Ptolemy and others actually invented more modern systems of geographic projection. Now this actual view is from the Middle Ages, it was a later reconstruction, but even back then when we go in 150 AD, people invented ways of taking the spherical Earth and mapping it to a 2D plane. And in this case, you know, this graphic actually shows a rather modern form of longitude, but latitude was actually measured in the length of the longest day. Um, and so you see these interesting representations that as people began to map the globe, they needed new visual representations to help with navigation, understanding territories, etc. Now jump ahead over a thousand years, and we see you know, obviously the rise of science um, you know, precipitated a lot of development in new graphical methods. This particular instance comes from Christoph Scheiner, who using early telescopes, was looking at the surface of the sun and plotting sunspots, and then invented apparently the technique of small multiples. This is one of the first instances known of actually replicating a visual scene to allow easy comparison with an eye span. So again, in this case, science really pushing forward our need for new representations. And as we move forward through the years, we see a similar push in other domains, including governance and economics. This is a map from the famous French cartographer Charles Menard, showing a flow map of coal exports from Britain to the rest of the world during the Industrial Age. And we see a number of interesting and novel design decisions made here, including how flows are represented through the thickness of lines, and also the distortion of geography, as like true geographic accuracy is less important than understanding the relative position and topology of the different countries and continents. And if we zoom in into the upper right, we see you know, another you know, visual innovation at the time. This is in the mid-1800s out of a stacked area chart. In this case, showing the breakdown of coal's use both within Britain and across the world. And we see that in just a 15-year period, the amount of coal use in the world, at least you know, from Britain's standpoint, almost doubles. So in this way, we begin to see these really interesting graphical innovations. And then, this is over 100 years ago, we see these being picked up by others. So for example, as demographic registers were implemented by various countries, we see the rise of these beautiful statistical atlases. This is uh, from France in the late 1800s, um, reflecting back the needs of government and businesses and these visual forms of understanding these data sets that are much larger than anything that had been worked with previously. 
And in this case, we continue to see graphical innovation. In this case, you know, many of us are familiar with tree maps today. We see earlier versions of this going back over 100 years, in this case showing the decomposition of the makeup of uh, rail traffic within France. And so my point in showing these examples is twofold. So, one, we see that a lot of these are very custom, hand-drawn visualizations that were well adapted to the task of showing very specific forms of data. And two, we saw that these graphical innovations were necessary to communicate this information. And so the question is, can we provide tools that help people make sense of data nowadays in similar ways? And I think that's the second point I'd like to make is that while at this time you know, governments and businesses were generating data sets that required new techniques, I think we sit in a really similar position today. And in fact, I would argue that we're in the crux of entering a whole new world. And um, this isn't just you know, obviously the data sets being generated uh, by new technologies for sensing, uh, simulation, and communication. Rather, even our entire lives are being conducted in ways that are amenable to digital recording, you know, as you know, shown on this map here. So how are we going to make visualization and exploration technologies more accessible? And we see some examples of how this will, you know, is beginning to play out in mainstream society. So, George talked briefly about Hans Rosling, who I'll show in a minute. Uh, we also have that we, um, you know, popular news sources like the New York Times are regularly using interactive visualizations to help communicate news stories. So I was saying earlier, George uh, showed us how Hans Rosling, for example, uses interactive visualizations to tell stories about global and health statistics. And the use of visualization, in this case, as a backdrop for storytelling. And indeed, others have shown that using visualization as a backdrop for storytelling may even contribute to things like winning the Nobel Prize. But perhaps most interestingly, beyond the, these applications, I think we're seeing that visualization is really entering the vernacular. So for example, visualizations are not just being used to analyze data, though that's one of their important roles, and not just to communicate, but to tell stories, to tell jokes, to communicate, and even as a form of personal expression. And indeed, as much of these data sets involve our personal lives, I think we're going to see not just specific uses of visualization in the normal paradigm of making sense of information, but rather visualization as a whole new communication medium with various um, possibilities. And so I think it's the case that we're entering you know, a, a real interesting phase where we have, see a rise of graphical literacy and expression. And part of this will be you know, the public understanding how to interpret a greater variety of visual representations. But I think any form of literacy is incomplete unless we also consider how are people going to author these? What is the writing component of visualization as a communication medium? And so I think it's useful to think about what are the most common ways that we create visualizations now. So I would argue that probably the single most common form is what the statistician Leland Wilkinson refers to as the chart typology. That is, you're given a set of predefined chart types from which you can select, and then you funnel your data into it in various ways. And so Danielle showed some, some examples of this in the previous talk. Here's another example from the popular website manyeyes.com, an online resource for generating visualizations, in which I might first upload my data set, in this case a collection of statistics about different states in the union. And then once I've done that, I can choose from a, a selection of different visualization types. These have been predefined for me, so I pick which chart type I think may give me the most insight into my data. And then once I've done that, you know, I'm given a view, I've often with you know, chosen default settings, and then I parameterize it to get it into the shape that I'd like. And if the chart matches well with the types of questions I'd like to ask, this is great. And there's a lot of you know, utility in having this very quick process. However, if the visualization doesn't express what I'd like, I'm really out of options. It's very hard to move laterally. Even simple additional design decisions are often difficult or impossible to achieve in this scheme. And so in trying to think about both the strengths and limitations of this approach, I tried to make an analogy to text. So if I were going to author text documents in this way, what would the analogy be? So one might be things like templates or form letters, where the majority of content is pre-specified, or the form of the content is pre-specified, and I have to fill it in. Another example would be something like this. You know, I'm given a template, and then hopefully I can tell the interesting story I want, given the constraints of what the tool provides. And again, while this is useful for a number of very common chart types, it's not going to cut the bill if we want to really expand our visual vocabulary. So fortunately, over the last two decades in information visualization research, there's been a lot of interest in underlying models for trying to represent the visualization process and thereby hopefully generalize uh, our approach to visualization design. This is one of the most common models called the Information Visualization Reference Model from Card, McKinley, and Schneiderman, which talks about a process of taking raw data 
and then you know, transforming that into some data representation that's amenable to visualization. Then computing any number of visual mappings, such as you know, encoding data with size, position, shape, color, et cetera. And then rendering that model into an interactive view, which in terms provides any number of interaction techniques, which allows feedback into earlier parts of that process. And so many researchers have since, you know, building on these ideas, say, well, can we componentize this model to enable kind of a richer expression of visualizations? So here's an example of that from scientific visualization. So here's a visualization of the ozone of the Earth. And what I'd like to call your attention to is the segment on the right here, which is this is how the visualization has been specified, in that you have a number of predefined operators for data transformation, visual encoding, rendering, et cetera, and then you chain them together in a data flow graph to build up the definition of your visualization. And then for any of these, we might need to further configure and parameterize it. So for example, in the bottom right here, we might parameterize our color map. And so moving away from the analogy of Mad Libs, I would argue that this sort of representation really kind of, you know, really is best described with a different analogy, you know, perhaps that of Legos. Well, you can build new designs by taking small pre-built components and composing them in novel ways. And I think this is a really intuitive and nice idea, but the analogy also obscures some of the difficulties that designers must go through to build visualizations in this model. If this were an accurate graphic, there would be about 100 buttons and knobs attached to the sides of each of these Lego blocks. And moreover, what we've found in deploying visualization tools based on this model is that to really achieve novel designs, particularly in information visualization, it's nearly always the case that you can't rely on the pre-built set of blocks. Rather, you have to invent new operators yourself, which requires significant software engineering expertise to achieve. And so to think about this problem often, as I showed in the beginning, look towards historical sources. And I was really inspired by this quote by the statistician John Tukey. And he said that today's first task, well, is not to invent wholly new graphical techniques, though these are needed. Rather, we need most vitally to recognize and reorganize the essential of old techniques, to make easy their assembly in new ways, and to modify their external appearances to fit the new opportunities. And so I think this still really plays into the LEGO model, but I'll argue should when we find the right primitives, that is, what are the things that we already know, but provide the ability to compose them in novel and easy to use ways that will also allow us to create novel visual representations as the result of these compositions. And so this has led to some current work we're doing at Stanford on a framework we call Protoviz. And the idea is to define a declarative language for visualization design. And the underlying conceptual model of the toolkit is intentionally simple. It's just that a graphic is a composition of data representative marks. And so we can make visualization, just boil it down to the process of you make statements that simply map data to a fixed uh, language of graphical marks. And so let me jump to give you do you have how this works? So what we found through exploration is that we can actually build up an incredibly rich design space of visualization with only a small number of low-level graphical primitives. Now note these aren't high-level abstractions as in previous toolkits. Rather, these are statements about very simple graphical marks, things like areas, you know, bars, plotting symbols, which we call dots, raster images, lines, labels, rules or grid lines, wedges, et cetera. With just these building blocks, we can actually build up, in a simple way, some very expressive graphics. And we do this you know, by just taking each mark, and it's parameterized uh, by a number of properties. So each mark has associated data and a number of visual properties, which may be either constants or functions of the underlying data or index. So for example, a simple bar chart might be a bar mark, in this case powered by, you know, just backed by a five element array of numbers, and then a set of constants and functions. So for example, I might set the left property based on an index and the height of the bar based on the data value itself. And in this way, what we're basically doing is designing style sheets for data. Uh, with the simple properties and simple functions, uh, we hopefully can create an interesting set of visualizations. Now obviously this example is, is fairly simple, uh, and this is how it would map if we would put it into programming language syntax. We've implemented this model in different programming languages, though our flagship implementation is in JavaScript and uses scalable vector graphics to enable uh, web-oriented visualizations. So in this case, we use method chaining and some, some of the niceties of JavaScript syntax to map that model into basically functional style sheets for data. Now, the real power comes out of composition. So in this case, I can build up uh, collections of marks to design richer graphics. So in this case, I might have defined some grid lines, which happens along the top here. And then a single line you see here, I've added a label. And this is just saying the label actually inherits the properties from the rule, simplifying the amount of work I have to do to specify the visualization. 
So through inheritance and smart defaults, as you might also see down here with these anchors, you can actually build up rich, nuanced visualizations fairly easily. Now, to understand the expressiveness of this language, we built a, a, a series of examples. So where we started was going back to these historical visualizations. Can we recreate the visualizations that were originally drawn by hand? Now this would be a good test to see whether or not we can achieve the expressiveness desired by our tool. So here you see a recreation of a famous chart by the Scotsman William Playfair, who invented most of our modern forms of data graphics in terms of line charts, bar charts, pie charts, etc. He really innovated and uh, disseminated those techniques. Here's another slightly more unorthodox example from history. Uh, this is a famous example from Florence Nightingale, who created this visualization to make a rhetorical point about the military conditions in England. This is a chart of deaths in the Crimean War. And this is a calendar view where blue indicates deaths that were due to preventable causes, where red are actual battlefield deaths. And so we're trying to make a story of how, you know, perhaps improve conditions and improve the military. And then, of course, we can make a number of more modern examples. So here's an, an interactive time series chart with focus and context techniques plus interaction, similar to things such as Google Analytics. Another example is parallel coordinates. This is a visualization of an eight-dimensional data set. This is actually of cars. So each axis here is uh, one dimension of the data, and then each polyline is one tuple. So we just map each dimension, and then we can use interaction techniques, such as dynamic queries here, to explore different properties. So in this case, I'll see that cars with low horsepower correlate with cars with higher acceleration. Other techniques include social networks. This is a version called an arc diagram, in this case showing uh, the strength of connections between characters based on co-occurrence in the chapters of Victor Hugo's novel Les Miserables. Other examples are small multiples. Um, actually, part of this makes it very easy. Just as you can replicate marks with data, you can replicate panels of data, and this will easily create a series of different charts. In this case, this shows economic data from the state of Minnesota over about seven or eight years. So for example, we see seasonal trends, such as that employment for amusement parks spikes in the summer and then strangely dips during the Minnesota winter. Um, other examples include things like stacked graphs. This shows 150 years of United States Census data um, showing occupational um, percentages. So we see farmers were a massive part of the workforce back in 1850, but have since died out. We could then search or click elements of interest, for example, to drill down and see just how dramatic the decline of the American farmer has been. And of course, no visualization toolkit would be complete without the ability to recreate what Edward Tufte called perhaps the greatest statistical graphic of all time, uh, Menard's depiction of Napoleon's ill-fated march on Moscow. Uh, of course, we can also use the toolkit to bring this into a more modern context. So here we see a recreation of Menard's original. And now we can bring it into the web age and actually, be, as a JavaScript toolkit, mash this up with other visualization and mapping libraries to answer questions that may not have been initially apparent before, such as, we know Napoleon marched on Moscow, but where does the army start in the graphic? Turns out it's not in Poland or France, as some may have guessed, but actually in modern day Lithuania. So those are some examples of what we could do with the tools to test the expressiveness. Um, but part of our hypothesis was that by reframing visualization around this model, we should make it more accessible, that is open, broaden the audience of people who can work as effective visualization designers. And so this we can only really study through live deployments with people with real data problems. And so I'll give you just a, a few examples of things that other people have built, many of them who identify as non-programmers. So for example, Clint Ivey was interested in business intelligence solutions, so he was able to implement from scratch bullet charts of famous and popular representation within the business intelligence community on his own using Protoviz. Robert Cassara, who's a professor at uh, UNC, uh, created a, an interactive visualization of looking at climate trends over two centuries. And this is embeds right in a, embeds right in a web browser and allows you to explore uh, climate trends um, over many different years. Um, music students have used this. This is work of uh, June O, oh, a music student, not a computer scientist at Stanford, who used visualizations of musical structure and was actually able to create brushing and linking, not just between visuals, but through audio as well. So you see this playback down here is coupled with the visualization as well. So she would actually use it to explore musical structures that she was interested in. And one of my favorite examples is an online app that you can find called Flickr Season. And this was a hobbyist who collected uh, Flickr tags using the Flickr API and then visualized their prevalence over different time periods. 
In this case, you can see a year view, so with a circular calendar, and you can see a histogram of when different tags occur in popularity. And the view that you're looking at right now is actually the visualization of the tags California wildfires. And you see it correlates with the dry season. You can ask this for a number of other seasonal questions. I encourage you to go online and search for things such as daffodil, which have very striking patterns. And then finally, I think one of the greatest signs of success is people can do things with your toolkit that you never expected. In this case, um, a computer science student, Vadim Ogievetsky, uh, designed a way to use Protoviz to actually implement Bucky Fuller's Dymaxion maps. And for those of you who aren't familiar, this is basically modeling the world as an icosahedron, which you then project down on the sphere. And then you can unfold that shape in any number of ways, giving you different geographic perspectives, while often minimizing the amount of area distortion you get in the map. And I was actually so impressed with this particular example, I subsequently hired Vadim as a research assistant in my laboratory. Um, and what the takeaway was, it was uh, a wide range of people are able to create very novel and customized visualizations using this underlying conceptual model of simple graphical marks. And so those are just some examples of visualization um, using this toolkit. There's a number of interesting avenues for related work. You know, one thing I haven't talked about in depth, which is also incredibly important, is the corresponding interaction techniques that go with these. And we have a model for interaction, but I think better models for interaction are needed. We've also explored applying this language model in other host programming languages. So for example, we've also able to take advantage of a declarative approach in an implementation in Java to get over order of magnitude scalability improvements over existing tools. And this is by not exposing control flow, we're actually able to make a lot of interesting optimi optimization decisions behind the scenes. And I think our approach might also lend itself to more graphical visual forms of visualization design. So can we build graphical visualization design editors that even further minimize the need for programming is another interesting question. But I think more importantly, we also have to realize at the end of this session that visualization is just one component, albeit perhaps a critical one, in a much larger life cycle of data. And this includes tasks of acquiring, cleaning, integrating data, visualizing data, statistical modeling, presentation and dissemination of results. And unfortunately, too many of our tools assume that we do this in a rather static workflow. Where, of course, any of you who've worked with data regularly know that, of course, is a highly iterative and interactive approach. And so I think a really interesting challenge, not just for visualization researchers, but that others in collaboration with database scientists and others is to figure out how can improved tools really realize the number of interdependencies that happen in real world data analysis and build better human centered tools to help advance our ability to work with diverse and large data sets. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. And I think we have just time for maybe one or two questions before we break for lunch. Thank you.